so how's everyone? Is everyone awake? <laughs> All right, good. Uh, so welcome to the conference. And uh, this is our second one, so I'm really, really, really excited about this. Um, and um, I'm going to talk about a topic that I know some about, which is the uh, state of dancer. I'm now maintaining uh, version two, and um, in charge of the development efforts, in a way, for different values of in charge. So um, I would like to talk about how we're doing, how things are going, and it is actually a very special uh, time for me because I get to do this years after I started joining the effort with the person who got me into this. So I want to give a big shout out to Sukriya who actually made it here. So we have. It is probably the, the, the place in which we have the most core devs at the same time, except the first FOSS demo in which we were four people and we stayed in the same room for two days. So um, it's very exciting. So we have Rusty over there, give a shout out. We have uh, Sophia and we have uh, Bucky and we have Mickey over there. So we have a few core devs here and uh, feel free to bug them with everything. That's basically what I do. So um, on the agenda, I hope you can see this. Can everyone see this? Is that good? All right, good. So on the agenda, I'm going to talk a little bit about Dance One, and we can talk a hell of a lot about Dance One too. And uh, I'm going to mention these topics. So I have the uh, project status. So how's it going in the project overall? I'm going to talk about the core dev group a little bit. I'm going to talk about community and uh, the different changes that we've had, new features that we have, and the future. And we're going to take this. And I did not time any of my talks, so good luck to both of us. So. I should probably start with popularity stats. I usually don't like this because popularity uh, contests don't win anything, they don't prove anything, they're not very interesting. But there are some statistics you might be interested in. Um, stars on GitHub, which people give a lot of importance to, um, very few people, some people give it a lot of importance to, which I actually think is ridiculous because it's very easy to click on star. And the same thing with forks, but we do have quite a bit, it's not that bad. Um, and, uh, I think that more interesting than forks and stars are actually um, how much interaction people have had with the project, and I think that signified better using uh, tickets, because tickets are actually someone approaching you, someone talking to you, someone generating a conversation, someone actually using your thing. I started a lot of stuff when I started on GitHub. It's very easy to do. Um, on the other hand, it's much harder to actually use this and then open the ticket saying, how do I do this? This doesn't work. What about this? I'd like to have, and so on. So I think this signifies interaction, we have quite a bit. If you take a look at pull requests, it's even more interesting, because pull requests are people actually submitting things, um, which are it's documentation changes, fixes, features, whatever it is. Those are a lot, and that is very exciting for me. We, of course, also have RT. Some people submit tickets on RT, and then we move them away. Uh, there's a mailing list, there are emails, I receive. There's a lot of interaction going on. Um, we have a lot of plugins. I took a look uh, yesterday, and we had 161 plugins for the answer one and 52 plugins for the answer two, which I would consider very successful considering I use one to two plugins at most. So I found that. Um, and a lot of conferences now have things for talks and uh, articles, and there are even tutorials, and there are um, trainings. So this time we had a training, but it was the second one. The yeah, Opsi may had a training as well, which was booked solid. Uh, we had uh, a lot of people in it, it was very successful. And we now have our own conferences, so this is the second one, that's not bad. And uh, blogs about it, and we appear in a lot of news websites, and it's really, really exciting. So overall, the state is very, very good. Talking a little bit about uh, conferences, conferences give us a lot of stuff. First, we can do trainings at conferences, we can make sure that you use the answer the way you're supposed to use the answer, or the way you, you really make all the best of it. Just make use of whatever it can offer you in the best way possible. And trainings allow us to do that. Additionally, it allows us to have a lot of community interaction, which we want. It is very, very important. Because Nanstra had always been a project that was driven by the community ever since the beginning. So we want to always have that interaction with the community. That's something that we can do at conferences. We can have a lot of feedback, a lot of co collaboration. We can sit down and we can hack in person together about the, uh, on different stuff. So we can hack in plugins, we can hack in architecture. A lot of the decisions we make, they can happen face to face because then we can 
go through so much of the details at the same time. And a lot of crazier ideas that we have also come up from face-to-face uh, -face interaction, which is a lot of fun. Some programs that we participated in. Uh, in the past, we had the Google Summer of Code, but we didn't participate in recently. We did participate a lot in Outreach. Outreach is a program originally called the Outreach Program for Women, allowing women um, to have uh, mentorship and to receive a salary for a short period to work on open source. It's very, very good. This is now the first round in which we're not participating since we started, which is quite a few rounds. And this is only for me to take a break to breathe, and then the next round we're going to probably participate again. So we always have people who are interested, uh, we always have women who are interested in uh, working on dancer and outreaching, and uh, the next round we're probably going to be there again, which is very, very successful. We also had the uh, Advent Counter. We've had uh, years in which we ran it, years in which we didn't. In 2013, we had excellent articles um, in the range of topics that they covered, stuff that people asked about, stuff that people wondered about, all the new modern stuff that we have. And we're going to do 2015, so it's going to be in November. If you haven't read the articles herein, please do. And then 2015, we'll cover a new set. If you're interested in helping writing articles, or interested in suggesting topics to write articles about, please let us know. A little bit about CORE. Um, the CORE dev group is about eight people who are usually not fully working on Dancer. Um, there are maybe about four to five active members, and uh, the rest are actually busy with work, and sometimes that shifts. Sometimes one person is busy at work, and another person has to uh, cover some slack. And we're now looking at expanding this group. We're looking at bringing in more people into the group. Specifically, we uh, had Jason join us uh, just now. Unfortunately, he's not with us today. He will be with us probably next year. And uh, Jason introduced a lot of documentation fixes. And generally, we have a problem as developers assuming that implementers provide the best uh, documentation, which is incorrect. We assume we wrote the thing, we know how to use it best. That is wrong. Oftentimes, we don't know how to describe it. We know how it, is, how it works, we know how it's implemented, we know the guts, but we don't really know how to best explain its usage. And that is something that a user knows even better. So one of the things that we're looking at is how to improve the documentation that we have from a user's perspective, not from an implementer's perspective. Jason contributed a lot to this. He helped introduce patches and he was very active on discussions on how to make the application is something that people can use and understand rather than just a set of really smart functions. And we were very happy with all of this work and really wanted to help and wanted to make it clear that the core group should not only be implementers, it should be people who work on the project and do good things on it. And implementing is one thing. Explaining what we have, making it clear, documenting, making it usable, making it approachable, um, all of this, uh, these things are very, very important. That's why we're very happy to get Jason's help. So he recently joined us, and if he were here, I would ask for applause for him, but he's not here. So let's assume that he got your applause, and we'll IRC him and say, hey, Jason, you know, everyone. Um, really nice guy. <coughs> Community is always at the heart in Pearl, but it's even more so in Dancer. The reason I worked on Dancer for a very long time was not because I was using it. I wasn't using it for anything. I didn't get to run a single line of it in production, and even outside of work. And only recently I started working the uh, last two years uh, more heavily on, on Dancer as part of my paid job. But the reason I was working on Dancer is because I really enjoy working with the community. Uh, the community is very happy, it's very warm, it's very kind, it's very open. You can often see people go on the channel not knowing uh, Pearl very well, not knowing Pearl at all, and people sit down and explain to them. Um, the policy and answer for receiving contribution has always been, if you want to contribute, we'll find a way to get uh, how to do it best. So we don't expect you to provide code with tests. We don't expect you to provide uh, code necessarily. We don't expect you to know how to create a pull request on a special branch that is rebased to master. None of these are requirements. And the community has really pushed how to treat others outside of code entirely. And that's something that I've always been extremely proud of. And it's something that I think we do really, really well. And I'm very happy with this. The community has always been a safe and open space. We've also made all of these uh, uh, things much clearer in a document that we wrote, Dancer 2 Policy, that basically outlines how we see the community. 
And it's something that allows people outside the community to see this is how we operate. This is how we roll. This is what we expect from each other. This is what we expect from ourselves. And if you would like to cooperate with us, if you'd like to be here, this is what we're going to expect you to behave like. And that is very, very important. Um, and it's not because we ever had incidents in which someone was attacked or felt uncomfortable, but because we wanted to make it very, very clear why that is. And the reason it is this way is because community is the most important thing in Mixer. And code is great, but people are even better. And um, I think this is one of the things that we originally got when we even started this. Um, the beginning of Dance Room was a community effort. Most of the features in Dance Room 1 were just people saying, I would like to have something. And all this, these things happen as part of conversation and less of opening angry tickets. And we always get that sense of conversation and um, unity. And I really, really like that. So, status. Um, Dancer 1 is frozen, fully frozen. Do not expect new features on it. We might fix things, but they will have to be good things that are important to fix for stability's sake. So, stable, secure, that's what we care about. Other than that, it is frozen. David Precious, uh, another core dev, has taken the role of um, maintaining this. Yannick Shanko had moved to work on Dancer 2. And don't, don't ask for new features, you're not going to get them. We're going to try and be as polite as we can, but you're not going to get them. Because we don't want to push Dancer 1 forward. Dancer 1 has very serious limitations, and we rewrote the entire thing in a new, um, in a new namespace just so we don't collide them for your projects. Please make the effort, move to 2, that's where you're going to get the new features. Um, so, that's one. Dancer 2 is actually the production version. Um, it is the series version, it has all the uh, new stuff. We made a lot of changes in it, we continue to make changes in it, but we consider it to be production stable. We use it heavily at Booking, um, a lot of other companies have been using it. I heard that Wells Fargo recently started introducing Dancer 2 in some of its applications. There's a lot of other companies, and I used to have a list of them, but it's, there's just no point at this, uh, at this stage. So I want to introduce some of these changes that we've done in Dancer 2 since the last year, since the last conference, and there's going to be even more next conference, but that does not mean that it is still volatile and you can't use it in production. It is way more stable than Dancer 1 for most things, and it is uh, massive. It, in general, it is absolutely stable, so you should use it. Um, so some of the things that we've done. We've cleaned up dependencies quite a bit, so um, we reduced the amount of dependencies that we have and we reduce the amount of dependencies that we need in order to install it, in order to test it, in order to run it. Um, this made it more stable. This made it more reliable. Um, we've added no progress, which I will explain just recently. <clears throat> we've made a serious change that was uh, contentious for some people because uh, we were using, um, we were writing web applications that sometimes returned Certain types sometimes return different types. So sometimes we return strings, sometimes we return structure. Sometimes we expect the structure to become a string, and sometimes you would expect the string to be ignored and just be sent as a string. So there was a very awkward behavior with serialization. The trick was that if you sent an HTML string, we would have said, okay, we don't touch it, even though you define the serializer. But if you send a structure, we send it to a serializer. Then we had a serializer that works on strings too. So basically, the serializer broke because that worked on strings and we ignored that part. So we changed it and said, serialization now is fully consistent. If you define one, you get it. If you don't define one, you don't get it. And that makes sense. But for some people who sometimes did this, sometimes did that, it became a bit confusing. And we've explained that with an article on why that is important, what are the security implications of it, I believe, and uh, why we changed it. We're not going to change it back. It has to be consistent. We are thinking about a new thing to accommodate people who have mixed behaviors, which I will talk about more if I get to it. We made, we made uh, a bunch of uh, major speedups to the Dancer 2 core. Uh, Someone opened a ticket saying, I use one because it's actually a bit faster. So we improved quite a few things and we sped it up. I've learned uh, a lot about middlewares and cost and profiling. It was fun. We actually integrated uh, quite a few middlewares into the core instead of having it as another layer because 
Uh, what happens with middleware is that you have to pack, unpack, pack again. Um, so at the point where we have the information, in most cases we can just use it, which we did. So things work way faster. We're not using middleware for static files. So this is actually made not because it's faster or slower, but mostly because it's just easier to implement this with a wrapper around it. So we have less code and less complexity in core. And we added delayed responses, which I'm extremely um, excited about. And it provides asynchronous code and streaming. Two different things, uh, similar. And our file serving, I believe, is automatic async. I got some doubts from Rusty recently, as in like about 10 minutes ago. No, it defaults to the right. So, but if, if you are running in an asynchronous environment, it streams. Which is fantastic because if you've ever done uh, async, you know that you can't block. If you do a file serving, you're blocking. So, you would have to serve it manually somehow. But our set file function, actually, thanks to Rusty, realizes that, oh, wait, you're in streaming mode. If I'm going to just serve it the way it is, I'm going to block your entire server and your entire process. So, instead, it just streams it fully. Which is really, really, really awesome. And we did a bunch of cleanups for the plugin architecture. The plugin architecture was not fully done by the time we finished a lot of other parts. And we didn't realize it and how bad it is. And we did round quite a bit, quite a few corners in order to accommodate writing plugins and using plugins until we finished rewriting the architecture in the internals. So we did that. And <clears throat> one thing I'm also going to talk a lot about is the new parameters that use uh, hash multivalue in the back end. If you don't know what hash multivalue is, the fun part is that you don't need to know. You really don't, and it's fantastic. So, let's talk about a few features that I actually want to put some time into and explain. First, no problems. This is something that we added just now. Um, if you take a look at use the answer, the command line, can everyone see this? No. Okay. <laughs> Let me see if I can... No. Let's hope this is the true of everything. It's good job. So if you use Dancer 2 and just call it use Dancer 2, you get three additional problems. Strict, warnings, and UTFA. UTFA doesn't harm your code. All it allows you is to do something you generally shouldn't be doing, but some people do when they're newcomers, which is to introduce characters in UTFA in the source code. So if you do that, it will work and you won't get warnings from uh, from Perl, which is nice. Uh, there's an open LP for it, so it's fine. Um, and strict warnings are just very common and you should probably use them. And if you use Moose, that's basically where we got this from. So it is the same thing. But there was a thread recently on the Pro Core mailing list saying modules that do this, like the instrument, Azure 2, Moose, Mo uh, Mo like they, they have a problem with this because if I try to disable my warnings, they will turn them back on. So if you have something like this that says no warnings, use the answer 2. Because you, you just the answer two, now warnings are named. So you didn't, you know, and this is might not be the best usage for it. This might be a better usage for it, even if I disagree. It says use warnings, so enable all of the warnings for my interpreter, and then disable one of them, which is for our initial. I personally like this one, but some people just ignore this and say scroll always does the right thing for our initialized variable, so I'm okay with that. And then you call use the, uh, the answer two, you have warnings again in it. All of them, including the one you see. So um, this this introduces some kind of complexity uh, that someone had in their environment, and they wanted to fix it on the Perl level. The answer on the Perl core list was you can't. <clears throat> this is a problem with those modules playing with your uh, properties, and that's what those things are called properties. And we looked at this. Uh, I'm on the core uh, mailing list as well, so we interacted. We talked about this. And the decision was to have Dancer 2 ignore this. Now, for those of you that have enough history, you would know that Dancer 1 has that feature. It looks like this. You have global warnings, you can turn it off. Uh, by default, it is on. And then a different way of doing this would be to change an environment variable that says Dancer underscore warnings, which is the same thing, even though it has different names. And the reason it has different names is because originally it was called warnings. It's a whole mess. And you set it to zero, and then you can use Dancer and that's it. So this exists in one. But there are a few problems with it. First, we introduced it because of one single person who complained about it. Which is nice, but it was only to cater to one person. And even though I love that person, that was not a good enough reason. Because the problem is that it also is specific to warnings. What about strict? Maybe you're trying to do no strict refs because you want to do something. 
or maybe you're trying to control uh, um, UTF-8, you don't want UTF-8. So the whole problem is that we're playing with your namespace and with your progress. So we decided to take a step back and how can we fix this for all of it? The simple way is to introduce user answer to colon no problems. So if you have colon no problems, we do not touch your problems in your call. So no strict, no, I'm sorry, no importing of strict, you can use strict. No importing warnings, you can use warnings. No importing of TFA, you can use TFA. The trick is that at this point you're basically saying, I know what I'm doing, don't touch my problems. And we won't. None of them. So this is uh, useful for moving forward. So you can have these warnings, you know warnings, uninitialized, and so on, and then you never have to worry. If we decide there's another very, very useful problem, and maybe we decide to import that too, and we're not saying that there is or that we're thinking about it, but if you do hit that situation, you can still fully control this on your own uh, terms. Delayed responses. Very exciting topic. I'm going to give a lightning talk about it that will probably cause tears. Um, but I'm going to explain it in a very easy way here, which is not implementation details. Delayed responses are another word for asynchronous responses, which means that you would have a response that then takes uh, a subroutine, it has to run something in a delayed context. It runs in the server after the request is already finished, which is pretty hard to understand, but the, at least at first for me. But the idea is that things are running in the background all the time on a single process, instead of having multiple processes. And that is something that is supported in the spec of PLAP and PSGI, but we didn't, um, we didn't have any good support for it in DSL. So there were no nice keywords to do this. So we introduced them. Additionally, there is streaming. Streaming is when you have an asynchronous response, but you're feeding the user chunks of data at a time. So you're not saying, I'm going to run something, and when it's ready, I'm going to send it to the user. Instead, you're saying, I have some of the data, let me send it now. I have some of the data, let me send that one now. I have a bit more data, let me send that one now. And it literally goes through the wire all the time. And that allows the user to incrementally update things. So like a status page, where you want to see each stage as it's progressing instead of the entire thing at the end. And that streaming support, that's another level of complexity for asynchronous, uh, asynchronous responses. And we wanted to support both of them. So let's take a look at the problem before we show you how we solve it, or before we show you the DSL that allows you to handle it. If you have a get and that has a sub, assuming you return a subroutine that could be called later, that subroutine later would have to send content. We have content and done as keywords that you could use. They are the equivalent of contextuals sending content to a user and contextual closing a connection. That's what they actually mean. So when you call, I have four minutes for the entire thing? No way, no. <laughs> All right. So if we look at our request cycle, we receive a request, we create an object for the request, we execute a handler, we receive a response, we create a response object, we send the response back. At this point, we clear all of our state. But if it's asynchronous, there's another step that is executing the asynchronous call. Because we basically said, when you're done, Please run this thing. And that's after we clean up the state. So, wait, the, the, what does that mean, clean up the state? State is such a problematic thing. And if you take a look at this, we actually clean it up. So when we execute it, there is no state. That state is what we need when you use stuff, stuff like uh, the request. You want to get parameters. You want to send stuff. You need that state. But we already cleaned it up. So at this point of the sub thing that you run, there is no context anymore. You can't send content. You can't get data from the request. We removed all of it. So this created a problem. The fix was something called relocalizing state using our and local, which I will explain in the lightning talk, which will be quite, uh, uh, hopefully, not as scary as it is to write. But what does this mean? At the end of the day, it means that all you need to do is call the lane instead of sub. And you still provide a sub. You now get all of your DSL, and you also have flush content in done. Flush will plus the streaming um, will actually start streaming async by sending headers to the user, content will send content, you can call it more than once to send more stuff, and then when you're done you can call it done, and you can run additional functions in the background. Um, a better way of doing this if you're doing streaming is use a counter that just incrementally does stuff on the loop, so if we do a flush we can create a timer that runs every 0.5 seconds, 
where we can send a, a dot to the user every 0.5 seconds. Oh, we're going to have to stop it. So we have a count and we count to 10. We do in depth to basically stop the counter from doing stuff. And then we also have to close the socket with the user, so call it done. And at the same time, we schedule more things to be done. This is how it would look like, fully supported. Pretty cool. Oh, I'm sorry, the sub here has to also be delayed because we're calling it via sub above. We also added error handling to this at some point. So you have a uh, delayed, flush, content, done. Content again, this will be a problem because this writes content to the socket, but this one closes the socket. So if you're writing to something you just closed, this will trigger an error. So now you can add on error. And then on error, you provide a subroutine, you get a caught error that you can use in order to figure out what happened. And this is for the entire thing. So if at any point the screen fails, your callback gets run. Parameters. Ah, parameters. So if we have a post, we call params, that's what everyone's used to. You get all the parameters, and then you call you go to foo. What is foo? Well, if we have a post that has a data uh, packet, this is the body parameters, foo equals bar, and then if we have the query parameters, foo equals plus, which one do you get? If you know this, you're probably wrong because we changed it. <laughs> so uh, let's make it a bit harder. You see that slash over there? Let's add a route parameter to this. Now what do you get? That's even worse. And that's part of the change that we made. Um, so now we have this code. Okay. The params here can actually be called with a parameter that helps sort this out. You can call it with a parameter, and then you know which one you get. So it becomes cooks because that's the match over here. Mm. Okay? Um, but there's also a query to get all the query parameters, so you can get this one. And there's also body in order to get this part. Now, there is an additional problem that it doesn't solve. The problem it doesn't solve is what happens if you call foo and bar? It will be bar, right? What happens if you call foo twice, right? You have two values for the same key, so we're going to still return something, we're going to return an array reference. <clears throat> and then you realize, I'm going to have to check for this. So you have a check, is it an array? Is it an array? Just normalize it to get only one value from it, unless I want the entire thing. Uh, the default in a lot of people's mind is to just get the last one just like a hash works. So you get the last one, you can change it to whatever you want. Some of us write this function to accommodate all of our code. Most of us don't at all, which means they only need to do is another parameter and shit breaks. <clears throat> so there is a fix. The first one is fixing the source, where it comes from. Instead of params route, we have a new keyword, route parameters. Now it becomes compile time. Instead of params query, we have query parameters, compile time. Same for body, body parameters. Then we have another fix, the number of values that you get. You either get one, or you get one or more, or actually zero or more, too. So, Parameters, uh, parameters query, we know we're going to check the query, change the query parameters. And now in order to get one value, we just say get. That's it. Um, and at this point, we just get one value. That's all there is to it. If you want more than one value, zero or more, you, get, you call get all. And now what you get is actually an array is always returned. Always. Even if it's zero, even if it's one, even if it's 100. So call get all, and that's it. It returns hash multi-value, um, so you can actually do more stuff with hash multi-value, but if you don't know what it is, if you don't want to, you don't need to, just call get or get all. You're done. We have some feature plans this is what you're going to wrap up with. Uh, we want to rewrite the documentation. We have some ideas, we need help. We need to know what is the best way to describe things. We want to rewrite the plugin architecture. It is actually already done by Yannick, and we're now uh, smoothing it over and taking a look at it. We're trying to re-implement some plugins and see how that works out. It's fantastic. We're very happy about this. So you're going to see a new, stable, fully done, uh, and architected uh, plugin uh, setup. Moving forward, then we want to make a consorted effort to convert all the important plugins. So 151, uh, 161 versus 50-something. So we want to convert at least the important ones or the useful ones. And that will be something that the community could just, maybe we'll open a ticket and people will just suggest more and more plugins and we'll collect them and do the conversion, maybe. There's a lot of buzz around WebSockets, and WebSockets are supported in Plaque, so you could use them, but uh, maybe you want to have some integrated support just so we can show. And the thing is that most people don't use WebSockets, and those that do, don't use it right, and those that then use it right oftentimes get screwed by the browser for removing them and enabling them again like 17 times. But maybe we'll add it just so some people will feel even more comfortable with it, having the feature. Serialization is consistent. If you have it, it runs. But maybe we want to allow overwriting per route. So you can say, 
This specific route, even though the entire app has a serializer and everything goes through it, the specific route is exempt. Or maybe the opposite, the specific route is going to go through this. And that will allow some easier transition. We want to have dancer app communication. A web app is composed of one or more dancer applications, and we are thinking of enabling an API to have them communicate to each other, like using the same instances for some engines. We want to rework the routing table. Um, the HTTP 405 stands for method not allowed. And that is, I match the path, but I couldn't find the right method for it. So you want to get slash. I don't have get slash. I only have put slash up or post slash. And we can do this the way that a routing table works without um, slowness. So what we want to do is reverse these and then match by path and then say, we found the method. OK, if we didn't to get a 405, which is the correct HTTP behavior, even though no one does it, but we probably should. <laughs> I want to introduce, I've been getting heavily into Access, and I want to introduce some um, new stuff, uh, a new distribution, Dancer to Access, which will be available for download and enabling. And once you have that, it actually overrides a bunch of stuff in core, just to give some C implementation of them. So you're going to have your application, then you install and, and add this, and suddenly things are blazingly fast, which is pretty cool. Uh, Perl Credit Perlint provides static analyzers for your code. I had already written a few policies to test it out, and it works really, really well. And goes and says, this thing you probably don't want to do. This thing is deprecated. You're not going to have it uh, later on. Um, and stuff like that. So warnings, errors, stuff like that. You check for them and find them. We want to enable HTTP extensions so you can provide your own HTTP vert. Add some debug panels specifically for Dancer 2 to allow you to debug things more easily. And we want to add some more distribution channels. It might be containers. It might be um, additional ways of just getting all the binaries, running them, making a, a, a deployment environment or a development environment even more easily. We're thinking about adding uh, uh, exception classes in core, which would be helpful mostly for plugins. Route caching was one of the first features that I introduced in Dancer 1, and we removed it in Dancer 2 because we thought, well, it's not that useful, but maybe it is, so we're thinking about reintroducing it and see what happens. We could uh, skip some regex checks, so that's not bad. And we want to have more of this, more of this conference, more of this uh, community effort. We want to have more of you. We want to see you more. We want to talk to you more. We want to know what it is that you're using Dancer 2 for, and how can we optimize and move forward in order to reach your goals at the end. So, unfortunately, I wish I had time for questions, but I don't. You can find me after the talk, running around, hiding. Um, <clears throat> and feel free to, to approach me, and, and I'd love to sit down and to talk uh, more about all of this and whatever you're interested in. Um, and the last thing I want to do is just thank you for your time.